Cher Monsieur Piquet, dear ladies and gentlemen, friends of the Institute, dear Michael, dear panelists, dear colleagues, dear students, good evening. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you here in the auditorium, in the Piquet Auditorium and online, and thank warmly for their presence and involvement our partners of the Fondation pour Genève, Geneva, Geneva Sol Solutions, all members of our panel, but also naturally the team at the Center for Trade and Economic and Integration for all the work and coordination that this kind of event implies, particularly in this context, as you can imagine. And I'm very happy indeed that we could do this in an hybrid format because as you may have seen, uh, we have decided at the Institute to be a bit militant about this hybrid format, thinking that this is also of our responsibility to, to go back to this kind of uh, physical event. I have the great honor, for those of you who don't know me, of being the new director of the Graduate Institute since September 1st, and I'm really very happy that this event happened just in time for me to be here. Let me reaffirm how much we value at the Institute, first our collaboration with the Fondation pour Genève, which is an old one, and how much I'm looking forward to continue and even to deepen our fruitful, this fruitful collaboration. This is also the first event we're doing together with Geneva Solutions, the new media that was created by ID News, with whom we also have a long-standing relationship, and I do hope, indeed, that many uh, joint events will follow. The topics of our discussion tonight has never been more relevant. Internet, and more generally, digital technologies were already strongly present in our lives before the pandemic before the pandemic, but their role and their reach has further expanded and deepened ever since last March. It's undeniable that internet and digital technologies have eased in many different ways the disruption that has turned our lives upside, upside down. They have allowed us to continue to work. They have made possible the continuous provision of necessary goods and services. They have allowed the continuity of medical surveillance and the treatment for many of us. They have also made it possible to keep our personal connections, even at the hardest times of our isolation. And here at the Institute, but also across the world in many universities, they've made it possible to continue our pedagogical mission in a relatively smooth uh, and in the end quite successful way. It's undeniable that we have collectively learned a lot and we passed a radical milestone in our use of those technologies in all dimensions of our lives. But as we are doing that, the question of the governance of these technologies becomes even more urgent and important because we have also become even more aware of their dangers and dark sides. All technologies are Janus-faced and internet is no different. It can bring the best, but it can also carry the worst. Before the COVID crisis, we were hearing calls for a tech for good revolution, particularly maybe in France, which was essentially about ensuring that these new technologies would be used in a way that showed us preferably their bright and positive side. But today, arguably, we need to go one step further from tech for good to what I like to call good in tech. The technology itself, not only its use, needs to be framed in a manner that will maximize its positive impact and minimize its negative ones. I'm very proud and happy of all the work that is already being done at the Institute in that direction, and the report we will be discussing tonight is clearly showcasing that. We see across the Institute that those questions are increasingly being asked and explored from the multidisciplinary perspective that is so characteristic of our institute. Here, I have to say that this is a topic and a set of issues that I've been strongly passionate about even before I joined the institute. In my previous position as Dean of the School of Management and Innovation at Sciences Po Paris, I launched a, a, a chair together with an engineering school, Institut Min Telecom, on precisely those issues. The chair was called Good in Tech, and is still called Good in Tech, and it had partners like Danone, Sycomore, um, Afnor, um, and Faber-Novel, amongst others. I believe that the Graduate Institute is particularly well-placed and equipped to become a major intellectual hub for the exploration of those issues, and I will personally strongly encourage our next steps in such a direction. 
But let me now introduce Michael Kende, who is the lead author of the report that is going to be discussed tonight and will lead us in the next steps of this evening. Michael Kende is a senior fellow at, at the center and teaching a course on internet governance and economics at the Graduate Institute. Before that, Michael was chief economist of the Internet Society and has been for many years advising governments, international organizations, and internet companies on policy and government issues. Thank you, Michael, for all your work, and I leave you the floor. Well, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, and thank you, Mr. Piquet, the Foundation, the Fondation pour Genève, the Center for sponsoring the report and for organizing this event. And thanks, everyone, for, for showing up. It's, uh, it's nice, after all this Zooming, to see people in person for a change. And of course, not everyone could, could be here, so we're going to be getting used to these hybrid events now. So just by way of introduction, the um, Fondation recently started a series of papers about the state of affairs in, uh, Gene in International Geneva and the centers of excellence. Uh, somewhat uh, prophetically, the first one was about uh, global health that came out on, in January before our current situation. And now, that, as, as we just heard, that we're mo more reliant on the internet than ever. The second one is coming out on how to govern the internet, and there's a chapter in there about how it's been the internet and internet uh, governance in, inter in Geneva has been responding to the pandemic. By way of background, there was a lot of resistance originally to the idea of governments in particular, but any kind of governance of the internet. It was really viewed as a separate space. This is a particularly um, vivid example written by one of the founders or one of the pioneers of the internet, John Perry Barlow, in Davos after apparently a couple of glasses of champagne and very strongly saying to people, the governments, we don't want you here, we don't need you, stay away from the internet in this declaration of the independence of cyberspace. But clearly, as everyone started going online, as more and more happened, as things shifted online, that was not tenable, that the governments would stay out of, the, uh, stay out of regulating and, and being involved in the internet. And sure enough, at the, just a few years later, at the World Summit on Information Society here in Geneva in 2003, uh, which was convened by the ITU under the patronage of then Secretary General uh, Kofi Annan, a group was set up to start thinking about internet governance and came up with this definition nearby in, at the Chateau de Bossy in, in Vaux. And that definition pretty much holds to till today. And I think the good news is that government, well, it was inevitable governments would be given a role, but they weren't given a primary role. They weren't given ownership. They were given a respective role depending on the forum and the issue that was being addressed. And this multi-stakeholder model of internet governance has held basically through today, and it's very well suited to a lot of the strengths of international Geneva, as we will see. Here in Geneva, the three uh, UN pillars are basically the foundation for internet governance. Uh, the three pillars of the UN being development, peace and security, and human rights. Each of them has a presence, is being worked on by the international organizations in Geneva, along with others. Each of them has now a host of digital issues that are coming up, and they, whoops, and they form the foundation for um, three clusters of internet governance here in Geneva. Digital for development, digital trust, and digital rights, and I'll go through each of these now. Um, digital for development has traditionally always had two tracks. One is to close the digital divide, which is urgent. We're still just about, just at over 50% of the global population online. So this is a, clearly a critical issue. But it's also recognized that it's a means to an end. Internet access is for getting online, but the, the purpose is to be able to do things when, once you're online. So it's always been recognized that the broader purpose of giving the access is, in this case, to help meet uh, development goals. And that's been true since the Millennium Development Goals of 2000 that led to the ITU having a critical role 
in uh, developing the ICTs and the, and the WISIS and, and beyond, and that's certainly true also for the sustainable development goals that came out in uh, 2015 and are being worked on through now. Here in Geneva, there's a big focus of work on developing the digital economy. Uh, that includes e-commerce work, uh, getting people to be able to trade online, um, and that's being done at UNCTAD and ITC and other places. Um, once more and more uh, online sales start taking place, they're going to be cross-border and digital trade has to be addressed, and that's being done at the World Trade Organization, the WTO. Um, is doing a lot of work, exploratory work now on, on uh, starting to think about incorporating digital trade. And once people start going online, work is going to be changed. And the future of work is another issue being addressed at the ILO, the World Economic Forum. And here at the center, there's a new, uh, uh, there's a new um, thinking ahead uh, for social change that's looking at the future, future of work as well. So that's the digital for development track. Uh, the next is digital trust, and there's kind of three overlapping elements of digital trust. The first, and clearly the one that, that occupies a lot of us, is cybersecurity, protecting our data from being taken and used uh, against us or for other purposes. Um, and that's part of it. And then you have cyber peace, which is to prevent attacks in the first place, state-sponsored attacks and others. Um, and that's been a big, a big element now of um, uh, digital or internet governance here in Geneva. And the final is, even when our data is not being attacked, someone is controlling it, someone is using it, uh, and maybe abusing it in ways that we may or may not know. And so the third element is ethical behavior. Uh, ethical behavior towards our data is coming up increasingly within digital trust. And all of these organizations, and certainly more, are addressing it from the oldest in International Geneva, which is ICRC, followed by ITU, to the three new ones at the bottom, Cyber Peace Institute, the Trust Valley, and uh, the Swiss Digital Initiative. And finally, there's human rights and their application of existing human rights from the Universal Declaration on Human Rights particularly privacy and freedom of expression, applying those to the online sphere. And the Human Rights Council here in Geneva appoints, has appointed a series of special rapporteurs who have come up with just this selection of reports recently on online hate speech, content regulation, surveillance, freedom of expression, and the right to privacy in the digital age. So this is another large area of focus here in International Geneva. Every cluster to be really successful requires to have strong foundations. That's both research and capacity building to develop and diffuse ideas. That takes place here, uh, as we just heard. That's taking place down the lake at the EPFL, the University of Geneva, the Geneva Academy, and last but not least, CERN, which kicked off a lot of the current use of the internet with the development of the World Wide Web and effectively the gifting of that to the world uh, without any license restrictions or uh, other, other uh, restrictions. And the other piece is a very supportive Swiss policy. I don't know if everything there is legible, but it's in the report, this uh, infographic. But the Swiss Confederation, the canton and city of Geneva are all heavily involved in helping to support initiatives um, for addressing a lot of the issues that we've spoken about, the ones at the bottom that uh, we'll hear from Jovan about the Geneva Internet Platform and Diplo doing a lot of work on the research and capacity building as well. In terms of an assessment, clearly International Geneva is a natural home for internet governance with all the international organizations, the permanent missions, NGOs, and others. But it's not the designated home. Uh, it can clearly take place elsewhere. And the work needs to be done to refresh, update, and, and uh, apply International Geneva to new challenges. One issue that, that, uh, that we focused on in the report was that a few of the key stakeholders in this multi-stakeholder model are missing. Uh, internet companies play, of course, a key role in the internet. They create the networks. They operate the networks. 
They collect our data. They're responsible for our privacy for that data. And other than uh, Microsoft and Jean-Yves Art here, uh, there's really very little internet company presence um, on a permanent basis in Geneva, and that would inform greatly a lot of the discussions that take place here. And on the digital rights side, the civil society organizations that are really specialized on online digital rights are, are largely absent. They'll come in for meetings, but there's no permanent presence. Um, going, looking forward into the future, it's clear that internet get governance is going to become more proactive. The laissez-faire period of governments largely allowing things to take place and then reacting when things didn't work out is probably coming to an end. No one's going to wait for the, the next wave of cybersecurity attacks on the Internet of Things for what artificial intelligence can do without taking proactive steps. And Geneva should also take proactive steps to be part of, uh, of that new phase of Internet governance. A few recommendations with the asterisk that these were written pre-pandemic and clearly some of them will only apply post-pandemic. Um, but Geneva can start to attract the missing or the other stakeholders with maybe a, a co-working space for visitors so that they can network and have a space to work. Uh, that could take place if there's room in the Maison de la Paix. That could take place across the tracks at the biotech, uh, campus biotech where a lot of the new initiatives are. And civil society, when I spoke to them, a lot of them complained or mentioned the costs of coming here, the costs of staying here. Um, and other costs, if those can be addressed, would help with that. To help to showcase what's happening in Geneva and contribute to the discussions, uh, there have already been a new series of co annual conferences on e-commerce that attract 1,500 people. Uh, the WISIS Forum is about 3,000 participants. There's a new AI for Good initiative at the ITU that attracts many participants when it was in person. And the two others that could take place would be an annual digital trust conference to address the key issues um, and leverage the work that's taking place here, and a, a digital rights conference to really highlight that work, which could be paired with the, the forum on business and human rights that takes place anyway every year here. So that would be a way to increase the prominence of those clusters. Uh, there could be more outreach highlighting what's already happening in Digital Geneva or some, some name and, and, and going to key conferences and saying that this is a good place to come and talk. And just in, in closing, there's been a, a lot of fragmentation of the Internet, content filtering issues, artificial intelligence and others. These are all important international issues that Geneva is very well placed to make a contribution to. In particular, as we heard from our new director, to maximize the positives and to minimize the negatives. And I'm looking forward to the discussion as we take these ideas further. Thank you very much. Is this on? Yes. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kazmira Jefford. I'm the editor of Geneva Solutions, a new journalistic uh, platform dedicated to international Geneva. We're delighted to be moderating the event this evening and to be a media partner with the uh, Fondation for Genève and the Graduate Institute. Thank you. So uh, let me introduce you to our five wonderful panelists. So one of them you've already met, Michael. Uh, so starting from my uh, right, we have Nicolas Nigli, who is the Deputy Secretary General for the Republic and State of Geneva. Then uh, Jovan Kobalia, director for the Geneva uh, Internet Platform. And uh, next we have Jean-Yves Art, senior director for strategic partnerships at Microsoft. And Doreen Bogdan-Martin, director of the uh, Telecommunication Development Bureau at the ITU. And uh, Michael, of course, thank you. Now, before we kick off tonight's debate, uh, or discussion rather, uh, we are going to quickly watch a short video from two guests uh, who uh, could not be here this evening. And um, so uh, from Doris Leutard, former president of uh, the Swiss Confederation and president for the Swiss Digital Initiative Foundation, and uh, Ambassador Hugh Glauber, the permanent representative of uh, Switzerland at the UN office in Geneva. So let's uh, take a listen.
Dohis, thank you very much for your time today. If you could just start off by telling us what are the most important aspects of internet governance and why? Well, so far, in the, when it comes to the internet, we have no real governance. We have a lot of principles, a lot of indicators, measures for the analog world, but to, but to transfer this in the digital world, that's now a big task. So we need a new governance, which is uh, accountable for the digital world, and that's why we think Geneva would be the right place to do this. We have a lot of UN organizations, we have a lot of embassies, we have a lot of universities, think tanks, NGOs, so actually an ideal spot uh, to be the hotspot also internationally for the governance of the internet. But uh, this needs also to be uh, showed, we must have concrete projects, we must have activities from Switzerland, from the canton of Geneva, from Geneva, from NGOs or other institutions, which shown we have already here an ecosystem, we can enlarge this and be valuable for the whole world. Switzerland is neutral, is in between of Europe, so we could also in this uh, a little bit separated world and different views be uh, the right place to show we have a good attitude, we have values, we have ideas, let's come and talk and solve these issues on the internet, on the new governance here in Geneva. We have the platform, we have the skills, we have the right people, so we are open to everybody. Geneva is the hotspot for international governance for the internet. Geneva has um, every chance to become the leader as a hub of internet governance because digitalization and the internet are not an end in itself, in themselves. They, they, are, they are a means, they are a, an instrument for all those organizations uh, that deal with specific issues like health, like environment, like human rights, and all these organizations are here because internet and digitalization has to be at the service of these organizations and experts, Geneva is the right place uh, to be. So uh, picking up on, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So picking up on uh, some of the comments made there in, in, uh, in the video, Geneva has all the attributes to become and to be, uh, as it already is, uh, a hub for internet governance, but that doesn't come without its challenges. And as uh, Ms. Leuter said there, we have no real uh, internet governance uh, as we speak. So Michael, my first question to you to, to kick this off is, uh, can we group uh, internet governance, as it were, here? Can we create one hub? And uh, is Geneva or any other city, for that matter, setting itself up for an impossible task? Well, I mean, I think I'm a little more optimistic than, than she was, I think, in terms of what's already taking place here. And she's, uh, with her Swiss Digital Initiative and Foundation, added another piece to the puzzle. Um, so I think, of course, every, every place is going to have work, and if you look at other cities in the world that are, do, that are working on internet governance, some of them have international organizations like Geneva, that would be Vienna, Strasbourg, Paris, and New York particularly with all the security work that takes place at the UN. It's not competition, but they're clearly doing some, but I don't think they have the depth or breadth that Geneva has in these areas. And then you look at the capitals, uh, Brussels and um, Washington, a lot of internet governance is taking place. It should be national, but as we're seeing with uh, what is happening with TikTok and Huawei, it has international ramifications and it's starting some fragmentation. And I think Geneva with its neutral um, reputation and neutrality could be a very strong place for a lot of these issues that are bubbling under the, the TikTok and Huawei uh, disputes to be resolved. Uh, let me pick up with uh, Jovan, because you, you know, you're really at the heart of, of the work here on internet governance in, in uh, Geneva. Can you perhaps address some of the, uh, if we can break it down into some tangible examples of some of the work going on, as Michael, you, you made clear in your, uh, in your uh, introduction. So what are some of the main issues, in your view, that are being addressed or need to be addressed and, and perhaps touching on your work as well at the uh, Geneva Internet Platform. Sure, thank you. Uh, congratulations, Michael, and congratulations for all involved in this important awareness building activity and this publication that can help raising awareness about, about these issues. But I would get back just to this interesting dialogue since we are at the academic institution and we have to develop critical thinking. 
uh, Michael is right. There are many places which are discussing uh, internet governance. But I would, ag uh, 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 I would agree with, uh, with uh, Doris Lloydhard on one point, and it is a very simple point. If any of us here in the room have to address any issue relating to digital, unfairly removed uh, YouTube uh, video, phishing attack, cybercrime attack, stealing of our data, whom we can address? Can we go to the Geneva police? Can we go to the cantonal police? And I would say Switzerland is probably one of the most advanced countries. We cannot address the simple issues, and this is a point where governance is failing. Because what is the basic role of governments is to deliver on the social contract. Let me add a bit of Rousseau and Hobbes and others. Social contract is government ensures us uh, security, freedom, market, democracy. In exchange, we pay taxes, the vote, and we are good citizens. In this deal, and I'm simplifying, but not oversimplifying, in this deal, when it comes to digital, governments cannot deliver its role and its promise. And this is the major issue. And in, to get to the old uh, Kissinger saying, whom I call when I want to call Europe, whom I call when I want to deal with my digital issues, and very it could be very personal, or companies, or countries. There are no places. And this is what we at the high-level panel of digital cooperation try to do to find the digital home for humanity, or that phone number that you can pick up and call, and then get what, what Michael said, to numerous places we deal with data, with e-commerce, with the standards and other issues. That's, I think, I would say underlying issue, and we are failing on it, and we are failing big time. Now, what are the, back to your concrete question, in addition to data, AI, cybersecurity, I would pick up two questions which are increasingly important. One is standardization. Standards are becoming soft politics and they are shaping AI, data, cybersecurity. And I guess next year standardization in digital will raise in relevance. The second topic is digitalization of traditional policy fields. You have now 30 or 40% of WHO agenda dealing with digital, with WTO. Therefore, over the next two or three years, we'll have increase of E, or cyber prefix, but then it will become just health or trade or any other issues. Therefore, that transition will be very delicate for missions here, for organizations. Therefore, increasing irrelevance, but then becoming just a policy issue, health or trade or humanitarian. I would, I would just for, students here and researchers, I would put these two issues high on the radar, standardization and digitalization of traditional policy issues. I think this is a good moment for Doreen to, to step in here. Uh, uh, when we talk about who to call, who, who we can go to, what is the ITU's role here and, and your, your take on, on these comments by Jovan? Uh, thank you, and, and congratulations, um, Michael. I, I think it's a it's a great, a great, great report. So, um, so I'm not going to talk about internet governance or the definitions. I think Michael laid it out well. I'm going to talk about the perspective of connectivity, and as you mentioned, Michael, half the world being connected. So we have 3.6 billion people that are not connected, and I think Geneva has a unique role that can be played. Uh, in this in this connectivity space, and as Michael was saying, and the, and the president as well in the opening, what's interesting, and when we look back to the first phase of the World Summit on the Information Society, and someone was reminding me the other day, when you look back to the missing link report that was released in the in the early 80s um, about connecting everyone, and we still have half the world not connected, and we've been making this case through Geneva, through the WISIS, the two phases, through the IGF and everything else. But what COVID did for us is it made the case. Finally, everybody gets it. So the, the case for change for connectivity was made by COVID, and I think in your one of your reports, uh, or one of the blogs, I think about your report that was released today called Connectivity the Ally for, for COVID. We call it the hidden hero. 
Um, and I think Brad Smith called it the, the accelerant, that COVID was the accelerant for connectivity. And we have to step back and realize when you started to write this report, COVID wasn't here. And COVID has absolutely changed everything. It makes us rethink internet governance. In some ways, it kind of depoliticizes the issue because as the UNSG said when he launched the high-level panel roadmap this summer, it's a matter of life or death. So connectivity is a matter of life or death. The people that are not connected, they, they couldn't go to work, they were at home, they couldn't get health information, uh, their kids couldn't go to school. Even in the United States, you have all these kids that, that can't do their schooling because it's continued online and they don't have connectivity or they don't have laptops. So really the digital divide is a huge issue. And even those that are connected, we would argue that many of them are underconnected. And it's not just a technology issue, it's also on the, uh, well, there's the demand and the, and, the, and the supply side, but it's that the digital skills, it's the online safety, it's the creation of local content, it's relevant content. There's all sorts of issues that, that need to be addressed. And so our take is, okay, now the whole world understands that connectivity is key. And as I sit here tonight with my SDG pin on, um, and we, we're all uh, geared up for the high-level debate next week of the General Assembly, we still make the case that we missed something. There should have been an SDG 18 for connectivity, or as my friend from UNICEF says, he said, connectivity is the hole in the donut. So my little pin here is a donut, and connect connectivity is the hole, or it's SDG zero, because really it's connectivity that's gonna help us to achieve each and every SDG. So I'll just pause there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nicholas, if I can uh, change tack a little bit and, and come to you to talk a little bit more about um, projects going on here in uh, Geneva. You're one of the founders of uh, Trust Valley, which was uh, set up in June 2020 uh, on the back of uh, this increased reliance on the internet, this need for connectivity. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the project and, and what your goals are there? Thank you so much, and first, um, thanks for having me. Uh, my response will start last, uh, with last Sunday. Last Sunday morning, I felt a bit dizzy, uh, a bit of a runny nose, a bit of a cough, <laughs> and uh, you can hear me, my voice is not terribly good. What did I do? First, I checked uh, the COVID tracker, right? Digital trust. Then I went online and checked out the healthcare uh, directives, uh, filled uh, out the questionnaire of the hospital, and uh, they then led me into a queue to get tested. Then again, another digital response uh, after the test. One good news, you're not suffering from COVID-19. So that's, 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 that's to avoid some sort of a panic mode here. <laughs> that's the, that's the first, 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 first purpose of this introduction. Uh, the, the second, obviously, is whenever you get through these channels, you realize how much digital trust really counts. And the absence of it, if you can't do all of these things, uh, you, you, you very much uh, suffer from it. Anton Chekhov, uh, quite a long time ago, quite before digital, uh, the digital age started, came up with this uh, wonderful word, you must trust uh, people uh, and believe in people. Uh, if not, life becomes impossible. Now we should add robots and algorithms. The Trust Valley essentially tries to find new solutions, multi-stakeholder solutions, within this region, uh, having so many assets, from global governance to fabulous, excellent uh, academic institutions to brilliant uh, companies and plenty of NGOs to try to tackle these digital trust problems from traceability to cybersecurity, data reliance. All of these issues we should, we should be tackled, uh, we believe, uh, more than just with states getting involved, because you're right. Uh, I think we still have lots of gaps in this digital governance, but the way we can find these solutions, I think, needs to be multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder. That's what we try to do. A bit more than 300 
Institutions dedicated to digital trust are based in this region, more than 40 international organizations, 700 NGOs, not all obviously linked to this, but part of them working on this. And, and by creating connectivity, we come back to the word connectivity here, uh, by getting them to work on concrete projects and, to make, and making sure that talents can flourish in this region, we hope we can make progress on this. That's, that's the goal behind the Trust Valley. I'd like to pick up on, on what you were saying here about this multi-stakeholder approach, because here, uh, Jean-Yves, you're our representative here from the private sector. And, and Michael, you, you did pick up on this in your report on if, if there is one of the gaps uh, that we do have in Geneva is, is the, the kind of presence of um, internet companies themselves. Uh, Jean-Yves, you're one of the only internet companies represented here in Geneva. What are the benefits of being here in person and why do we not have more uh, companies representing here? Thank you very much. Um, um, I'm going to answer your question. The first thing is that I would like to congratulate Michael for the for the report, uh, which I have used, uh, I've um, uh, gone through it, uh, and I will do it again because it's very, very rich. And so congratulations for, for this great report. Um, why is it that um, uh, Microsoft is here uh, at Geneva? Um, I think um, we are here because we believe we, under, we believe that uh, a number of um, digital or internet governance issues uh, will need to be addressed. Uh, that they will probably be best addressed at a global level. Uh, that is by the UN, uh, and that Geneva has a role to play in the um, intervention of the UN to. Um, provide uh, those indications in terms of governance. If you think about what the, the main governance issues are, there is one which uh, you have very eloquent, eloquently uh, described, Doreen, which is inclusion. For me, that's number one. Just as you mentioned, it's really number one. Number one is inclusion. The second one is fragmentation. The geopolitical tensions that we see in the real world um, being um, um, echoed uh, in, the, uh, in the digital space uh, where we see silos in data, silos between applications instead of something which is key to the internet, which is interoperability. So for me, fragmentation is, the risk of fragmentation is a second risk uh, that need to be addressed when we talk about internet governance. And the third one is one which has already been mentioned is trust. And trust covers different things. It's security, it's privacy, it's safety, safety of the content that you put on the internet. So um, um, inclusion, fragmentation, uh, and the last point of uh, trust. Those three issues, in our view, should be addressed at the global level. They should be addressed at the UN level. Uh, I think we are pleased, uh, at least speaking my own name, I am very pleased to see that um, the Secretary General has um, commanded a report on digital cooperation. What is it that the UN have done? And, and Jovan knows the report very well, uh, as many others here that have uh, contributed to the report. This report now has a roadmap, a number of recommendations, uh, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a great, um, a great progress uh, in terms of governance to see the UN taking a role. And of course, the UN is New York, it is Geneva. Uh, the, the UN agencies here in Geneva, whether it is uh, the ITU, uh, it is uh, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, UNODA and others, they have the expertise uh, to contribute to the development of that roadmap. And on top of uh, uh, finding the expertise in those um, uh, specialized agencies of the UN here in Geneva, the other benefit which Geneva offers is that Geneva is in Switzerland, and therefore Geneva benefits from the neutrality of Switzerland, which uh, I think you um, mentioned, uh, Michael, neutrality of Switzerland, and also the standing that Switzerland benefits uh, on the international scene. And I think that these are very important elements when you try to find a place where you can have this cooperation which is needed, this multi-stakeholder cooperation, those negotiations, where can they take place? Where can they take place better than here in Geneva, where you have the expertise of the international agencies, of the UN agencies, in a country which 
uh, is a neutral and benefits from a pretty high standing uh, on the international scene. So for me, this is, um, th these are all good reasons why Geneva is the right place. Now, of course, we also need to recognize that there are challenges. Um, UN may be a challenge. Things are happening outside of the UN sphere. Think about the Paris call on cybersecurity. Think about the Christchurch call on safety, on the content which is put on the internet. And these are developments which are taking place, which are there, and that I think um, UN agencies at some point need not necessarily to replicate, but to also integrate and to, to, to work with uh, those, those um, kind of extraneous developments that are taking place completely outside of uh, the international system. I mean, that more than cities, uh, it is this process which should be brought into the UN system to the whole extent possible. And uh, Michael, are we, you talked about this resistance to, to governance that historically kind of pre preceded today, but are you, are you seeing more um, cooperation from the private sector to, to uh, more involvement, more engagement uh, with the international community, with NGOs um, to engage on, in this debate? Well, I think that, the, I mean, the current tech clash has clearly uh, impacted the companies. All of the, the major Facebook and the others are putting out statements about privacy, rethinking the way they're looking at it. Uh, after the Cambridge Analytica, Facebook and the others, maybe too slowly, maybe not by November 3rd, but they're starting to look at what's happening on, on the elections. Um, so I think it's, it's, slowly, it's slowly coming, and it may be that self-regulation is viewed better than government regulation, but there's certainly more interaction, and some of it, I, I think, is no longer uh, necessarily a choice. As I was saying, the governments are definitely getting more involved. They're not going to sit back and watch, um, watch these things replicate, and then when you know, self-driving cars come, not have enough sec security in them, they've already started to push back on you know, the Libra cyber currency whose association is based here. So I think there is a shift, and I think that willingly or otherwise, and I think some companies are willing and others aren't, uh, the companies are starting to, to move along in this space to, to develop the trust and work with the others. And uh, Nicholas, I can see you nodding here. I was wondering if you had wanted to add to, to that point. Uh, I'm very optimistic as well, not just because we, we see a great interest from, from many places in the world for this ecosystem, but also because a lot of young entrepreneurs with vibrant dynamism are, are really growing things out of here. Let's not forget we have, we have fabulous talent uh, around here in, in our uh, uh, academic uh, centers, and, and, and they, are, they are coming up with, with really, really brilliant ideas. Uh, so so I'm, I'm fairly optimistic about that, but it's very clear we need to keep on working on this uh, tirelessly, uh, both uh, inside and uh, outside. But I'd like to come back to, to this point uh, around connectivity. I think this is, this is a fundamental point. And, and I love your point about you know, the, the whole donut being essentially connectivity. But to me, and, and you're right fundamentally, I, I think SDG 17, that, that's what I feel. SDG 17 is, is, is sort of partnerships, innovative partnerships for the goals. And I think that's what Geneva's identity certainly should aim to be. That's where we can forge these alliances, these partnerships, to create a, a more holistic capacity to deliver and to finance uh, the, 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 the implementation of, of the goals. Uh, Michael, congratulations, and I forgot to, 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 to say this in the beginning <laughs> for your excellent report. I think in, in, in your recommendations, there are three points, right? Uh, bringing in more stakeholders, and, and I think I added to this nurturing more new stakeholders as well. I think that's, that's, that's absolutely key. New initiatives, uh, fundamentally important, and we, we, we certainly keep supporting many of them, including in the field of uh, creating more uh, connectivity, 
uh, how and why should we talk about uh, internet regulations if about three, three and a half billion people still have no access to it? Uh, and just to give you an example, uh, 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 we, we facilitated uh, the creation of a new foundation recently called Afri Afri IA, Afria in French, uh, Afrique and IA. Uh, the idea being that we, we, they want to empower uh, the, the capacity to build technology and inter uh, artificial intelligence in, in Africa. They, they have chosen Geneva as a seat and will build from here. Very exciting uh, new project. But the last thing which I would really insist on is we, we need, and we are working tirelessly on it, we need to think better and, 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 and more, uh, for, more, more uh, thoughtfully about how to uh, fasten and, and, and deepen uh, cooperation. Uh, I think, Jovan, in, in, in the report you have uh, co-directed, uh, that has been a, a, a very strong recommendation and at the end, uh, boosting cooperation within the ecosystem. To me, this means also bringing into the game possibly new digital commons to do uh, analytics and visualization of data interconnectivity. There are so many data silos here in Geneva. If we want to implement the goals, we need those silos to break. And very often, and that's to the point uh, you mentioned, Jean-Yves, that there are these, these tensions, geopolitical tensions. Are we going for Chinese technology or for American technologies? Perhaps there is a need for an alternative here. And, and that's something we need to think uh, more uh, about and, and to, to deliver for the international community as well. I think it's fundamental. Mm -hmm. And uh, talking about more cooperation, I mean, this means more inclusive, including everyone. That means addressing the gender gra gap, including uh, more developing countries in the conversation, including minority groups. Uh, Doreen, how do we get, uh, how do we try and bridge this uh, divide and, and get a more inclusive uh, conversation? Um, thank you. Uh, maybe just a, a quick point on the, on the investment. So tomorrow we're releasing our Connecting Humanity study where it shows that, that it will take $428 billion to connect the other half by 2030 if we want to have everybody online. So we do need, we need, the, we need the investment um, and we need partnerships. So I, I, I mean, I, I completely agree. Yes, SDG 17 has it. Um, it's all about partnerships because we can't do it alone. Uh, no one can do it alone. No one country, no one company. Uh, and we all really have to work together. Um, and just to, to link this back to Geneva, I think many great things have been born in Geneva and now what we need to do is scale them. So when it comes to gender, for example, we have, of course, the, the gender champions that were born here, and I think that's really moved the needle uh, on gender issues, and it helped me personally push this issue in my own organization, which was not particularly doing well in terms of uh, female participation and, and representation. And linked to that, we started something called EQUALS, the Global Partnership to Bridge the, the Digital Gender Divide, where we have uh, over 100 partners. We've worked closely with uh, the Graduate Institute, we work closely with UNCTAD, uh, we work closely with ITC. So looking at, you know, how can you use digital to close the digital gender gap? Uh, and specifically with UNCTAD and ITC, how can we look at um, digital entrepreneurship for, for, for women and, and girls? Um, another thing I wanted to mention, which is a great example of partnership, is something that was born from the SDG lab. And I don't know if Nadia is following uh, or here tonight, but that was a, a, it was a sort of by chance uh, and Michael, you cover it well in, in the report, and it's the Niger 2.0 Smart Village Project, born right here in Geneva. Uh, the gentleman from Niger came, visited Nadia, she called around, made some appointments, everybody started to talking to Ibrahima from Niger, and then all of a sudden, this smart village was, was, was born. And it was about connectivity, connecting villages in Niger, but not just connectivity, what happens when you get connectivity? So WHO was involved, uh, FAO was involved. Um, so it was all of the other applications part that you get when you actually connect a village. 
uh, and we've done lots of other great work as well with WHO on, uh, on eHealth, Be Healthy, Be Mobile, and with COVID, again, coming back to COVID, we've been able to uh, kind of tweak some of these efforts to address the, the current problem, so to get uh, health messages out to uh, holders of, of 2G phones or using drones to spread health messages. So I think a lot of great things already happening here, even with digital, digital skills with ILO, but great stuff here that we can, we can scale and get out to the masses. And speaking of other, uh, other initiatives here, uh, Jean-Yves, Microsoft is, is one of the uh, sponsors of the Cyber Peace Initiative um, here, which re recently opened in Geneva. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Um, what are the issues it's addressing? And, and how does one go about reaching a, a consensus and finding consensus in this space? Sure. Um, so the Cyber Peace Institute uh, is uh, an NGO um, that uh, Microsoft and a number of uh, other partners, um, in particular uh, the ULED Foundation and MasterCard, and these were the three funding partners initially, uh, set up in order to address um, a number of uh, cybersecurity uh, issues. Um, and um, it has essentially three missions. Uh, one is a mission to uh, collect information uh, about the cyber attacks uh, and those that are pretty harmful cyber attacks, uh, collect information and give information about uh, the impact of those cyber attacks, and that's what we call accountability, but it's not accountability of the owners, it's more creating a sense of accountability uh, for uh, those cyber attacks. Um, second mission of the Cyber Peace Institute is a mission of assistance, assistance of, uh, in particular, civil population that have been affected by uh, cyber attacks. And the third one, the third mission, is a mission of advocacy, um, uh, bringing the message uh, and more visibility uh, to the message that uh, those uh, cyber attacks which have um, harmful uh, effect uh, on systems and on individuals uh, need to stop. So these are really the three missions uh, of the Cyber Peace Institute. To a large extent, I would say, when we were thinking about where we are going to uh, place uh, and set up the Cyber Peace Institute, um, the, the factors that I was uh, mentioning earlier, which are the expertise, the network, which exists here in Geneva, and also neutrality uh, of uh, Switzerland and the international standing of Switzerland uh, were important, uh, important um, elements uh, to, to take into account. Uh, so for me, these are really important things. I, I would like if uh, you allow me to also come back to one point that um, has already made, which is how do we uh, bring people to Geneva? I mean, that is one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is how is it that Geneva goes to the stakeholders that have to contribute to that? And I'm mentioning it because we have seen recently some states, and which I think may be very effective, some states, some countries um, uh, appoint tech ambassadors uh, Denmark has done it, France has done it, and if you try to think a little bit about the role of Geneva, what you want to do for Geneva, what you want to do for Switzerland, again, as I mentioned from my perspective, and <laughs> one of the reasons why I'm here is because we believe in those reasons, Geneva is the center where you can do a lot of internet governance, but if you want to, to increase the visibility of Switzerland and its standing, thinking about having tech ambassadors that go to Silicon Valley, that go to China, that go to where the main actors uh, are located, um, uh, the main players uh, in those digital technologies debate. I think that is something that could be could be considered. You need to think about the size in which you you do it and and who's going. And whether you have the manpower, who, what are the, the who was the profile of the tech ambassadors? But I think that it it really raises the profile of the country um, when you have tech ambassadors in, in foreign countries. Well, hopefully the people listening will, will take those uh, that advice on board and uh, start thinking of sending uh, ambassadors. Um, Jovan, if we can turn back to you, because we haven't heard from you for a little while. Um, can we talk a little bit about your uh, humanism uh, initiative? And so we touched upon, we haven't talked much yet about uh, artificial intelligence and the issues surrounding uh, the 
growth of AI. Tell us a little bit about this and what uh, the challenges you see ahead for trying to address these issues. Sure. Uh, we, we are all faced with the AI narratives, uh, which are becoming a bit of hype. Everybody speaks on AI. And uh, what, what we, we have been trying to do at uh, Diplo, first, whenever we discuss governance issue at the Geneva Internet Platform and Diplo, we have to understand technology itself by programming and by looking under the bonnet, because there are a lot of discussions without understanding what's going on. Therefore, we did the blockchain analysis. Therefore, we started uh, uh, creating AI applications by using neural networks. And next week, we will uh, basically launch speech generator, which can uh, deliver, prepare speeches on cybersecurity by using AI. Now, if you look at the title of the project, which is Humanism, it is anchoring AI into the hu humanism. Therefore, trying to see how AI can serve the core values of humanity. And here I come to the few points in addition to technology, governance, uh, there are also very fundamental issues about values. And I think Geneva is the right place to set back and to get back to fundamentals. And I will mention three communities with whom we are engaging more and more on discussing fundamentals on ethics, on epistemology, and other issues. The first community, which is completely ignored in internet governance, is online gaming community. It is extremely powerful, the resort of money in the, in the ga online gaming. It impacts the next generation. It, is, uh, it has a lot of policy effects. And apparently around ANSI and Geneva, there are quite a few online gaming companies. That we are engaging with them in discussion on the, on the online gaming. Big show in Fribourg. There are really vibrant online gaming community in Switzerland. But unfortunately, in Geneva, so far, they're missing. And, uh, and when you discuss with them, they realize, wow, we are going to face governance issues sooner or later. My argument is that it will be very soon because their impact on the next generation is huge. Second community in this humanism discussion is the religious community. We have been working a lot with Vatican. And one of the most impressive discussion on ethics and AI was held uh, at, in Vatican. And uh, these people, they were doing ethics for, what, 20 centuries? And they know what they are talking about much better than, uh, than, uh, than, than others. That was, I suggest, if you have a time to look at that conference summary, it was a really impressive thing. Third community uh, is community of parliamentarians. And, we, and here is the International Parliamentarian Union. Therefore, in Humanism Project, we are developing new tools. We are going under the bonnet and seeing how they work. And based on understanding how they work, we are developing governance principles and engaging, well, engaging of obviously traditional international organizations, but putting a lot of efforts on online gaming community, on religious community, and parliamentarians. Uh, we've talked about some different sectors there, but it'd be great to, to get to break down and get a little bit uh, more stuck into some specific sectors. For example, uh, global health. We don't have any representatives from the health sector here tonight, but uh, uh, perhaps Michael or, or Doreen could talk a little bit about um, digital, digital rights in the field of, of health uh, as it becomes more and more uh, de democratized. It's, it's you know, an ur urgent issue. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe a quick comment on the, on the gaming point. Uh, when I was on my way over, um, I had my first experience at a, uh, a virtual beach party. Uh, and it was this gaming app that, um, that's been developed uh, with UNICEF uh, around our school connectivity effort that we call GIGA. So it's something the ITU and UNICEF teamed up to try to figure out how to connect every school in the world and every young person to information, opportunity, and choice. And I think your gaming point is really a good one because when we think about the future of learning, particularly online learning, which is with us for now and <laughs> it will be well, for a long time, we gotta figure out how to use that gaming community because that's how younger people or older people are 
it's, it's much more engaging, right? And so we, we have to figure out how to do that. So that's a, a challenge, I think, uh, for the future and perhaps something that, that Geneva can, can step up and attract more. Um, and that, that a really good, good point, um, Jovan. And on the, on the health side, um, and I, I want to come back to the point that was raised before about fragmentation. I think what's great now, and going back to say, you know, connectivity because of COVID, I think what's really good now is that this fragmentation amongst organizations with WHO here and uh, the refugee group over here and uh, WTO over here, it's all like we're forced to be interconnected because our own constituents, for us, it's the ICT regulator or the ICT policymaker, they no longer get to make their decisions in isolation because everything they do will have an impact on their minister of health uh, or on their, their trade minister. So it's all interconnected. And I think that's where Geneva has an opportunity with the agencies and the stakeholders here to really push for that kind of whole of government approach. You mentioned the, the digital ambassadors approach. I mean, that, that's also a good one, but to really push for this interconnectivity and holistic approach amongst governments and amongst the Geneva community to push for, for digital right across the board. And that's particularly relevant now in the, in the space of, of the health sector. Uh, so, Jovan Pass, if you... Just the, the, to add to the high relevance of the dis, uh, interdisciplinary approach, you're probably familiar with M-PESA project in Kenya, which is the inclusive finance. When you analyze how M-PESA happened, it was a, generally speaking, it was a governance solution because the people in charge of banking sector, banking regulators, came together with the telecom regulators and anti-monopoly regulators. They sat together and they say, okay, let's do a governance innovation and let's create the space for the MPESA to happen with SafariNet, the company and other things. Uh, we always focus on the innovation, technical innovation or even business, but there is a need. I hope you're well. <laughs> sure, okay. <laughs> I started on purpose with warning okay. about this. this okay, this I will stop, stop so my no intervention. <laughs> but the governance innovation is extremely important. And uh, as, as uh, Doreen said, uh, that, that's a great chance for Geneva to even physical proximity. We go for coffee breaks. I hope it will return with WHO people, ITU people, WIPO, with Jani when he joins us in, the, in, the, in downtown. And we shouldn't underestimate that, even that physical proximity, uh, Saturday markets uh, in, the, in, in Oviv uh, and uh, the places where, where I make a quite a foot, I connect quite a few dots in digital space. But M-Pesa is a good example of governance innovation, not necessarily business innovation or technical innovation. Uh, so last, last uh, point to finish off, Michael, and then we'll, we'll take uh, questions. Yeah, on the health issue, I think that um, if you've been following these contact tracing apps, they really distill a lot of the issues that we've been talking about because on the one side, there's a lot of positives. If someone gets a, uh, you know, a, po a positive COVID test, they can put something in and let everyone know that they've been in proximity with. And five, 10 years ago, we might have said, oh, this is great, but I think now that there's we're in the middle of this tech clash, there's a lot more skepticism. Is that the only reason they're gonna use it? Are they gonna know our name or just a number? So it brings up all of these uh, digital, uh, digital trust issues. Who can tell us that this is only being used to tell that you've been near someone but not who you've been near? And the rights issue. And I know there's been work uh, at EPFL on the contact tracing. I think, Jovan, you had a session on contract tracing and human rights, and it kind of distills the whole space that we're at. It would be great if we trusted it, it would obviously be good, and, but uh, now there's a little more skepticism than there was a few years ago. Okay, well, thank you very much, and now we'll, we'll turn to the floor for some questions. So if you'd like to raise your hands, if you'd like to ask the, yes, gentleman in the middle. And a microphone is coming your way. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. We talk about uh, numerous institutions and what we have, but we didn't talk about what we miss 
as an institution, what we lose. And I want to underline here today on the, the fund, the digital fund, digital Solidar solidarity fund, which have been created since the beginning of YC's process. But uh, it used to be a sexy story. But delocalization of this institution to the neighborhood country since then, unfortunately. But yes. Since a few years ago, we found also another fund which is focusing on drugs and public health, patent pool, and it worked very good in Geneva. But our meeting here today on the future, we did the accreditations, a digital fund as a legal uh, status as an NGO in ITU, but the future of internet governance in Geneva today is having again in Geneva City the digital fund for solidarity. Once again, the collective effort is needed. Thank you very much. Just to clarify that there was no question there, just a, a statement, right? Thank you. And uh, gentlemen at the back, uh, back row, please, if, if you'd like to give your name as well and, and who your question's addressed to. Thank you. And uh, I'll, just, I'll just take my mask off to uh, uh, ask the question. My name's Jonathan Andrew. I'm with the Geneva Academy, also with Empowerment Lab. And I'd just like to take the opportunity again to um, congratulate Michael on an excellent report. Um, my question is... One regarding the speed of development of technology. So it's, a, it's quite a broad question. When we see in, in terms of digital technologies, amazing advancements taking place with engineers looking at redesigning chips for quantum computing and ripping up the rule book and, and really looking at you know, amazing, in a, you, taking up amazing innovative approaches to their um, pushing the boundaries. How can we map the process um, that we, the many processes we have in Geneva regarding uh, regulation, governance, which are very, um, very much iterative, slow, deliberative, process of, uh, processes of engagement with different stakeholders, with civil society, with governments, um, with businesses? How, how can we possibly um, achieve um, the requirements we have in terms of governance when we're seeing technology marching forward? Um, do you see any ways we can uh, address those concerns, any ways that we can possibly look to future scenarios and preempt some of the problems we're seeing um, today and further problems in the future from a preventative basis? Who would like to take this one? Michael, would you, or, or Jovan, I see your reason. Well, uh, on, the, on the question on, on, the, on the speed, one has to be a bit, bit careful. When you analyze internet governance, you don't have that many changes since, let's say, 1998 when ITU decided to host the versus or a internet icon was established. I think we are sometimes really uh, too excited about technology, but ultimately governance of technology is about human relations triggered by technology, legal aspects, socio-cultural, political aspects. Uh, therefore, I, would, I like the famous Churchill saying, the more forward you would like to see, the more backward you, you need to look. And uh, some of the issues are as old as, old, as, old as uh, Plato's uh, cave or, uh, or the Rousseau's writings or Voltaire's, uh, Voltaire's discussion. Therefore, that element is, is important to follow, uh, especially AI is a bit tricky area because we may get to the situation which uh, I think Hemingway said when they asked him, how did you get bankrupt? And he said in two ways, gradually and suddenly. <laughs> and this is the only tricky area where we may, we may be careful to do precautionary principle to see if AI can, can uh, sort of uh, uh, bring unintended consequences. Otherwise, technology to the large extent can be anchored in existing regulation. Application is different. Let's say you have a cyber crime, but you don't have a cyber jail. Jails are still traditional. And you have, you have many issues which are sometimes, uh, I would say, more hype when it comes to novelty, everything is changing. Therefore, some critical thinking at, here in Geneva, in particular Graduate Institute, University of Geneva, other places, 
has to really to revisit what is the hype and what is the reality. My only concern, major concern, would be an unintended developments when it comes to some aspects of AI. That would be a tricky area. Everything else, e-commerce, taxation, it's more just a matter of applying existing rules and twisting them here and there. Uh, Jean-Yves, you also want to add? I think you, you are uh, very largely uh, correct on, on your last point. The, the, uh, the other point which I would make is that um, your question seems to be premised on the idea that uh, the regulation and the governance that we're talking about are compulsory rules uh, which are set in stone or which evolve uh, pretty slowly. And, and, but we see uh, a number of developments and governance coming up progressively, slowly. I referred to the Paris call, to Christchurch call, which um, provide indications on what states are supposed to do, and Paris call at the moment is in the phase of transformation and implementation of those, of, of, of those principles. Uh, Christchurch call um, provides guidelines on what companies should be doing uh, to avoid the repetition of the drama that happened there. Uh, and so, um, for me, th there is also this aspect uh, that um, we should take into account. It's that um, governance is not necessarily compulsory rules sanctioned by you know, uh, criminal or civil liability. Th there are many different forms. Uh, a good example, uh, we have talked about uh, the, the, the Trust Valley um, uh, or the Swiss Digital Initiative. The Swiss Digital Initiative is working at the moment on the development of a label, uh, a trust label, which is going to uh, be based on um, uh, certification of elements of, of safety, of privacy. You know, a label is also an element of governance. And so I think we need to, to have a, a much broader um, um, much broader view of what govern, the, the forms that the governance can, can take. Uh, I, I, would you like to add to this? Yeah, only for a, a few seconds. Um, in uh, 1830 in, in London, uh, the British Prime Minister then, uh, Lord Palmerston, by receiving uh, his first uh, telegraph uh, said, my goodness, this is the end of diplomacy. It probably wasn't. Uh, it was in fact the very beginning of what we nowadays call multilateral diplomacy because at the time they realized they need to have multilateral rules to govern how you would have these exchanges with, with telegraphs over over the borders it's not just this is it's not just sufficient to do it bilaterally you need to have a, a much larger uh, footing the question now in my opinion is really to just come back to Jovan's point what do we now need to do to add to what already exists to tackle these issues on AI according to some of the latest studies we nowadays uh, use sometimes without being conscious of it, uh, about we, we use AI, AI in, impacts our lives about 220 times a day on average in our countries. And there are, there are predictions that this is going to rise to about 4,500 times a day by 2025. So quite a large acceleration. And the question really is, how do we adapt the way we tackle this governance issue, uh, and it might be through, through systems we have not yet invented or just adapting what already exists, but very clearly that's, that's, that's where the next really big question is. How do we, how do we bridge that gap? Uh, that's, that's, that's something we need to think about very hard. I think we have time for, I can see two hands if they're quick questions, so. Uh, the lady on the, the left here, and then a last one here from the gentleman in the middle. It'll be a very quick question. Um, I just wanted to know uh, where you stand on the idea of an international digital convention, or Geneva digital convention, which has also been circulated sometimes, just on this idea of uh, something that would be created here that sets the rules on so many cross sections, on trust, on so many things. I'll take that one. Uh, so, 
So this uh, proposal for a digital Geneva Convention is something that, um, uh, in fact, President Microsoft, uh, President Brad Smith of Microsoft uh, um, proposed, uh, I think, in 2017. Um, these were a set of uh, principles governing responsible state behavior uh, in cyberspace, um, rules that would apply to especially cyber attacks uh, and nation state cyber attacks. What we are seeing these days is that there is a lot of um, and, and, and I remember that uh, when, when we talked about the Digital Geneva Convention, I mean, the call was that we, uh, when, where, uh, when, when can we do this? Uh, and sometimes I have questions, so where are you and uh, is it done? Um, I mean, things are moving, things are moving forward um, on cybersecurity and we see the UN again taking a, a, an important role uh, in that place. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the Swiss ambassador to the UN, uh, now here in Geneva, uh, chaired one of the uh, working groups uh, on the development of those norms of responsible uh, state behavior in cyberspace. So things are progressing, things are um, going in, in the direction of you know, creating more stronger principles uh, on, on what uh, the states will do. At some point, you may um, uh, have a convention uh, that was a call for definitely progress uh, on that space. And, and, and we see the progress uh, taking place at the moment, again, in the UN, um, in the UN circles, uh, more in New York than here in Geneva, uh, but who knows uh, where it will end up. We have, we have uh, one question from, uh, from one of our online viewers. I'm just going to rely on the question from EPFL Invasion Park to Jovan. In your opinion, how can the gaming community concretely contribute to internet governance? They are, in a way, receivers of the governance solutions. Their business model will depend on governance, like Facebook is now asking for governance and the others. Therefore, their social impact on next generation, their financial might, will obviously raise the question of governance. Therefore, they are, let's say, on the receiving side. They have to solve the problem of security. They have to solve the problem of uh, uh, data protection and privacy. There are numerous issues which are related to, to the gaming community. That's the first point. The second point, they can be active contributors in a way that they can, uh, through what uh, Doreen mentioned, they can start developing new application in online education. They can also, also even in governance, to popularize some of these issues, to make them closer to people. Therefore, they are missing actor in Geneva and in governance community in general. And uh, there is an interest. They are seeing that it is governance issues are coming to them, they cannot ignore them for too long. Therefore, why not to engage them, both as the contributors and people who will uh, voice their concerns? The only regulation is WHO regulation, in which they have a um, dependency uh, as a sort of risk factor, health risk factor of the dependency, and that's the only regulation so far. But more is coming, and in that sense, in that, that sense, uh, why to wait uh, somebody to knock on their door? Why not to be proactive, to engage, to develop proactive solutions and to contribute generally to inclusive and more creative solutions from online learning to governance, to engagement of elderly. You have so many areas where gaming community can help. And one final one from the gentleman in the, in the middle here. Thank you. Uh, general question and coming back to what you once said at the beginning, to whom do you complain when you have a problem on the internet? I think this is the basic of everything because, and the one who are not really represented here are the consumers. And these ones, I mean, I'm not sure that we do all we should do to protect them, I mean, to protect ourselves. So in order to create governance, you don't think that we should put a fundamental uh, document as human digital rights, where we protect human as a whole. Because uh, internet, by definition, goes beyond boundaries. 
So national sovereignty is not able to, to protect beyond your own boundary. So if we don't have this fundamental element where we can all find ways to, to make it implemented, how can we create a real governance? We will always be much later than uh, development because AI will go faster and faster. And if we work in the same way that we do for normal conventions, I mean, it will take ages till we agree. So maybe it shouldn't be time to, to put the fundamental text protecting digital human rights and from there to continue to work. Who would like to, who would like to take this uh, question, Doreen? Well, uh, maybe just a, a, quick, uh, a quick comment. I, so you started saying, you know, who do you, who do you complain to? I mean, on the other side, how do you know what your rights are? I think it, a lot of it comes back to, to awareness and, and education. And I think that, uh, that we need to do a better job, for example, in schools, uh, in educating children of, uh, about their data, about online safety, educating parents, educating teachers. There's that whole awareness raising uh, that, that could be done better globally. Geneva could certainly start. Uh, and we would need to engage regularly schools. I mean, I used to argue uh, my children are all now in university, but in elementary school and high school uh, with Action Innocence, they were great, but definitely there was not enough done. And we need to do much more to, to educate people from the first time you get your, your first mobile phone to your first laptop. What do you need to know? What should you do with your, you know, how do you manage your data? All of these things were not... Uh, we're not doing a good job in, in getting that information out there. So I see that as a big gap. And I wanted to come back to the gentleman's point about the, the Digital Solidarity Fund and why it didn't work, right? Uh, that was from, from WISIS 2003, 2005, looking backwards again, Jovan. And is there a need for something like that now? We're trying to look at creative financing ways through our, our GIGA school connectivity project. And we've been inspired by Gavi and how the Gavi Alliance was structured, pooling together demand. So can you pool together demand for connectivity and then figure out a way to, to then make it profitable? You can have different entities bidding on different pieces, but how can you then make it profitable? So I think maybe a fund, one single fund isn't the answer. There's lots of, there's more than 90 countries that have universal service funds, many of which are large. Is that a source? There, there's lots of, the World Bank is doing lots in this space. So I think there's, there's a range of different potential funding sources that need to be brought into this. Uh, but I think often governments continue to put connectivity as maybe not their top priority in terms of financing. And we often have a problem with ministries of finance taxing because it is often viewed as a as a luxury privileged good and so it's overtaxed and so that that financing issue still remains a, a big challenge thank you i think you'll all agree with me that this has been a very uh, engaging interesting uh, discussion thank you very much uh, to all our panelists uh, for tonight's uh, event and uh, to michael for uh, for the report and uh, please join me in giving them a round of applause. <laughs> and uh, we'd now like to invite uh, Mr. Yvon Fichte to the stage uh, from uh, President of the Fondation pour Genève. Well, um First of all, congratulations to the panel members um, for their very interesting uh, contribution and I think to the public also for uh, some challenging questions. Um, congratulations, of course, for the uh, report that uh, uh, we asked uh, uh, Michael to uh, prepare for us. Um, bringing this very important subject of uh, internet governance uh, into more light and uh, as it seems uh, a very urgent uh, issue. I mean, when one believes that uh, the first uh, conference uh, on internet governance was in 2003 or even before, uh, uh, I mean, the 
uh, obviously, internet has grown in an absolute uh, incredible way, exponentially. Uh, and today, with very, very hot uh, uh, issues, uh, I'm thinking, of course, about the uh, uh, réseau sociaux uh, and democracy, about artificial intelligence, about uh, cyber space and security and and many other things, e-trade, e-commerce, e-payments, e-currency, whatever. Um, so I guess um, I'm not, I cannot obviously uh, sort of make a summary of uh, everything that was said uh, now as uh, it's very fragmented uh, and uh, I'm not as knowledgeable as uh, the panelists, so that would be anyway impossible. But uh, what I um, see in uh, Michael's uh, uh, report uh, are three or four challenges, and if I just can say a word about it, what I, what I feel about them. Um, there are lots of initiatives, as we've heard, in fact, today, but little results, uh, it seems at least. So although there's been some optimism shown, um, one can't really see out of the report that there is a real drive towards any kind of a solution for uh, internet governance. Um, now, of course, the, the UN has created the, uh, last year a high panel um, of uh, internet governance. And I think Doris Leutart uh, our former president of the Swiss Confederation is part of uh, this this uh, panel. Um, this came after Antonio Guterres, uh, the SG, uh, sort of blamed even Geneva for not doing enough uh, in order to come up with uh, a proper internet governance. Uh, and um, so um, then, of course, the the Swiss. Uh, uh, Confederation also has been very active, as uh, as we have heard, um, and I'm not going to list, of course, all the uh, things that were uh, sort of uh, uh, originated from from Bern, but obviously the the Swiss uh, Digital Initiative Foundation was uh, created in 2019, I think, and this year they came up with. Uh, uh, a sort of report uh, with a roadmap, as we heard uh, during uh, the debate here. Uh, we hope that something will come out of it. We haven't seen yet much, nor have we seen from uh, uh, Geneva um, uh, sort of initiatives, um, a sort of real sort of combined effort to arrive to any kind of internet governance. I think what one one obstacle, of course, which has not been mentioned, is that the UN is weak. Um, its multilateral role is very much challenged, as you obviously know today. And uh, I think before we come up with a revised multilateral definition um, in today's world, in the 21st century, uh, let me remind you that uh, uh, the current multilateral system dates back from 1945. Um, I think there will be no major advance from the U.S. side, and uh, I'm afraid uh, that uh, uh, obviously ITU is uh, in the middle of uh, this difficulty uh, of um, uh, sort of weak leadership uh, of, uh, of the U.N. system today. Uh, and Switzerland, of course, cannot do much on its on its own, though it's an ideal place, as it was said, to uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, have any um, sort of governments uh, uh, on the internet. But uh, I, and I think the second challenge I notice uh, in the Kendi report is um, um, about about the fact that we don't have. Uh, uh, civil society, we don't have all those multi-stakeholders, uh, civil society and private companies, apart from uh, uh, Jean-Yves Arts uh, company, Microsoft. Um, 
but uh, I guess one thing that is missing maybe uh, in, in the report, although it's mentioned, but, but not very much, and it has not been mentioned today, is the fact that we have in Geneva an organization called the World Economic Forum, uh, and uh, which, is, uh, which has uh, 750 people, of which about 100 are experts in uh, IT matters. And uh, I think they're already very much in touch with uh, international organizations, but not in a coordinated way at all. And I guess that uh, uh, we will not be able to bring the Alibabas and the other GAFAs uh, necessarily to Geneva. There is no uh, reason they should establish themselves here, but we could at least make a better usage of uh, the WEF, and uh, I'm sure there could be a much stronger co collaboration uh, there, which also would bring uh, maybe civil society um, more to Geneva. So um, the third challenge, uh, and of course that uh, was uh, uh, sort of uh, pointing out to uh, 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 to uh, Marie-Laure Salle. Um, uh, it's not her fault, she's only been here for three weeks, but um, um, it's the, that the, 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 the academic world in, in Switzerland, or at least on the Lac Léman, uh, Lake of Geneva region, is not uh, responding in a cohesive uh, way. Uh, to the challenge, and that uh, each university has its own uh, sort of uh, way of of uh, taking over subjects. I think it's a little bit unfair, obviously, when we look what the institute has been doing in this respect here. Uh, there is lately an artificial intelligence initiative, um, but uh, there's also an interdisciplinary share uh, which uh, treats a lot of different aspects of uh, internet governance, except maybe the legal side, which is more at the university. But, but it's true, obviously, that we could do better uh, on the uh, academic side. Now, finally, uh, uh, to conclude, um, uh, uh, I can quote maybe uh, Joseph Nye uh, from the Kennedy School of, of uh, Government, uh, in the U.S., um, who uh, was interviewed by the Fondation pour Genève, uh, the delegate Xavier Contes, uh, ten years ago, and we have a, a full report on that, who was uh, clearly uh, uh, designating Switzerland and Geneva in particular as being the ideal place for conducting, for being a uh, um, uh, the uh, sort of uh, governing, uh, internet governing or IT governing uh, uh, sort of place. Because we are the ideal place for so-called soft power uh, uh, and ideal place to uh, come up with uh, soft uh, laws. So uh, we should, um, we should um, I think it's in our DNA uh, to, uh, we have the conventions of Geneva we talked about the convention, it's maybe not a good idea in this case, uh, but, uh, but I think we, we should obviously um, um, uh, talk about, uh, about uh, uh, bringing Geneva, uh, making it happen in Geneva. And um, so uh, I think those obstacles are, are, not, um, are not really uh, sort of stopping any kind of uh, advance in bringing a proper governance to the uh, challenge of, uh, of internet. And uh, what we can finish maybe with a word, we, yes we can, I think somebody else than I said it before me, but I guess uh, that uh, I would like to conclude uh, with this. Uh, I think uh, we really must uh, have an organization, it might be the IGF, it might be another one, uh, that really takes the lead in Geneva in sort of uh, getting results in terms of governance. Thank you very much.